Chapter 3, all about motherboard. So we're going to be talking about the different types and features of a motherboard. Uh, we're also going to talk about how to set up the BIOS. What is the BIOS? We're going to talk about some uh, how to physically connect some of the jumpers if they're required, uh, maintenance, and how to properly select, install, and replace the motherboard. So, first thing is motherboard types and features. Motherboards come in many forms, many types, uh, and with varying prices depending on features. Motherboards can range from twenty, thirty dollars to several hundred dollars. Again, all depending on what features you need. A motherboard, it is the most complicated and sophisticated portion of a computer. Uh, that's subjective. I would also include the processor. I would say both of those are the both are the most complicated. And it's actually one of the first items to consider when building a new PC. And the reason the motherboard is the first is because everything has to connect to it, including the processor. Now you could say you could select your processor first, then your motherboard around the processor, but a lot of these conversations go processor and motherboard together, so I wanted to bring that up. Considering the following, uh, when purchasing a motherboard, when you go to purchase one, we look at form factor, we look at uh, socket, we look at uh, buses, and the number of expansions, as well as what slots and ports are available. Now, as we start talking about the size and the features, we kind of have to think about, you know, its purpose, its requirements, how large of a case we're putting it in. Um, normally our cases are ATX, micro ATX, uh, mini ITX, which typically is just mini ATX. Uh, it all goes back to size. The reason the size is important is because as we start talking about what the use of that PC is, the size comes into play. If you're building a home entertainment PC that needs to be extremely small, you might not want a full size case. You might need a smaller, either micro or mini case. It really all depends on, again, your purpose. Uh, here's an example of a mini case. It's extremely small. But you'll notice there's not a whole lot of room for adding anything. So that's a problem. It's only a problem is if you need to do upgrades later. So here are some other examples of other form factors. ATX, which typically is a motherboard uh, 12 inches by 9.6 inches. That's going to be one of the larger motherboards than micro than mini. I'll let you read through all of them. Uh, realistically though, ATX and uh, micro ATX, those are the most popular. But again, it all really depends on your needs, your requirements. Uh, BTX was a standard that was out for a little bit, but it didn't take off. It's fairly larger than a ATX board, but oh, also it had more expansion slots, but it really didn't take off. So you don't see a lot of BTX boards out there. However, our chassis, our cases, they're all capable of handling any typical size motherboard. Again, you normally want to verify with documentation just to make sure, but typically most cases can take all uh, type of motherboards. Next, our processor sockets. This is where we're actually going to be installing our socket, installing our processor into the socket. <laughs> uh, typically it holds either an AMD or an Intel based processor. Um, now, keeping in mind, these are just umbrella companies. There are several, several brand of Intel, 
and there's several uh, several uh, brands of AMD. Intel, that's one of their major uh, manufacturer capacity is processors. Not their only, but one of their big ones. And so they have several different types. So you have to keep that in mind. You can't just say, well, I have an Intel-based processor. There's so many other types of Intel-based processors out there, you have to be a little bit more specific. Chapter 4 is all about processors, so we'll go more in-depth then, but for now, those, that was just, those are two general processors that we'll be dealing with, and it's more of a just, hey, this is what we're going to be working with, mainly. Uh, the reason I say that is because the processor conversation is a lot more in-depth, and I don't want to go too far in-depth with it just yet. Uh, next is our processor socket. Is it a pin grid array? Basically, does it have pins? Or is it land grid array? And essentially, that is no pins. It will just use a pad. Now, there's other types of arrays, but the pin versus land, those are the most common. Here's an example of a pin grid array. You'll notice the pins are actually on the socket instead of the processor. Now let's actually talk about the socket itself. A zero insertion force socket, which means you don't have to force it in. You just set it down and that's all. Uh, normally there's a lever to lock it in place, but that is all. I will let you look over this slide. Uh, there's so much information here. Most of the time, you don't need to know all of these. You just don't need to look over the most common or the newer ones. Because uh, again, this is just AMD family uh, processors, and there's so many of them. Here's an example of pin grid array. The processor has all the pins. And the socket is just holes. It's the female end. Which means that processor could be easily damaged trying to install it. Next are chipsets. So when we talk about a motherboard, we actually break it down into different areas. We have the north and we have the south. And when we talk about the north bridge, that is high speed, fast, versus the south bridge, slow. Now the manufacturers of these chips can be numerous. Intel also makes them AMD, NVIDIA, SIS, VIA. Those are just some of the common chipset manufacturers. And how that works is, our North Bridge is typically one of those major manufacturers. Now again, keep in mind, the North Bridge is just like a controller for everything that's fast. The video, the processor, the memory. Because everything else is a lot slower than that. So it goes to the South Bridge. But that North Bridge controls access to the processor via Buses. The buses is, are just the links between the devices and the processor. The important part here to realize is when you have a fast lane on the freeway and you have slow lanes and you have slow traffic in the fast lane, it slows down the fast lane. So that's the analogy that most people use when we talk about the separation of the North Bridge and South Bridge. Because again, if anything that was slow was put on the North Bridge, it would cause everything else to slow down. And uh, we don't want that. We want the North Bridge staying fast. So 
a few years ago, AM, or, sorry, Intel came out with a Core i7. And that kind of changed the way the Northbridge functioned. AMD, for the longest time, stayed with that traditional Northbridge and Southbridge. However, a, uh, Intel found out that if instead of connecting the memory directly to the North Bridge, if they move that directly to the processor, you get more speed. So here the North Bridge is again deals typically with our video memory and processor. It's just the memory is directly connected to our processor now, which allows for faster connection. This is pretty common chipset now. Uh, the number being directly attached to the processor. So, when we talk about chipsets, we talk about the different types, uh, like Intel has their Ivy Bridge chipset. This is just the architecture or design of that chipset for that particular model. We'll go through different uh, generations. Like the Ivy Bridge is the third generation i7. It's no longer the most current, but it's just the third development of the i7. And some of the nice benefits of that is it uses less power, uh, more transistors, uh, performs better, and so forth and so forth and so forth. Now, the this is kind of biased. So far, we're talking about strictly Intel. However, we have AMD as well. Uh, again, I'm, I will let you three uh, read through all of these because there's so many of them, it's hard to know which ones are super important versus which ones aren't. Uh, realistically, I've never encountered someone that asks, you know, what is AMD 9 series and what's its benefits? Uh, normally, when we talk about processors, we look at our needs, and then we start looking at both AMD and Intel, and we kind of decide which ones which based off of off of that. Nvidia, Sys, and Via, while they're all chipset manufacturers, they also all make graphic processors as well. Now it's important here to realize when we start talking about video. We're going to bring up Intel, not, I'm sorry, we're going to talk about Intel, NVIDIA, and AMD. Intel has built-in video to uh, the newer i7s, so the video is no longer a dedicated strict device, or no longer has that dedicated device. You can still use a dedicated device, but it's now part of the actual processor, not a separate video processor. AMD and NVIDIA, both of them have uh, specialized types of video connection that I thought was very important. You'll see that the last bullet point talks about SLI. So NVIDIA has a technology called SLI, and that is where you link multiple video cards together of the same brand and type to have it work as one larger video card. Basically means it will share resources between one another, making it faster. Uh, AMD has their, uh, the same similar thing, and it's called Crossfire. And that is, again, hooking up multiple video cards to work together. So, our buses and expansion slots. Our buses are again just a pathway for communication between the individual components. The bus control or has a power control uh, addressing and data going through it in binary. Uh, binary we already did, which was two states on off. A typical width of a data bus or the data pathway could be 8 bits or byte and that is just how we measure uh, how much data can go through those buses. Here's an example of 
an 8-bit bus. There are 8 individual connectors connecting the memory and CPU. Now this is just an example. There is more than typically 8 bits, but here's just an example. So the important part here is, how is the data being transmitted over those lines to the processor? Is it being done uh, parallel, which basically is uh, multiple components being transmitted over the same connection at once versus serial? Serial is one task at a time. The goal there is serial or the, the logic behind the serial is if you're focused on one task, you can complete that one task faster versus parallel. You have multiple tasks you're doing at once, each of them taking a slightly little bit longer because, again, you're separating your resources to do each of those tasks at the same time. Next, uh, our buses have some form of system clock. That way, everything is based off of the same time. And this includes the speed of our memory, the front side bus, that's just the bus between our processor and Northbridge, or memory, uh, our processor, and other uh, components uh, as it communicates as, over the motherboard as a whole. And it's normally measured in hertz, which is a cycle per second. Uh, megahertz is one million, Gigahertz is 1 billion, terahertz is 1 trillion cycles per second. Now keeping in mind, a motherboard can have more than just one bus. It has several buses depending on their needs. Again, going back to our chipset design, our North Bridge versus South Bridge, they are going to have separate, uh, separate buses because again, their uh, control sphere, the North Bridge, it deals with the video processor and memory. They're going to have faster buses. Our South Bridge, which will be everything else, might have a slower bridge or a slower bus because it's a slower bridge. So as we start transitioning into our different types of ports, our first common one is our older video, and this is our AGP, which you'll see in a second uh, a graphical representation of it so that we can see that it is different. Uh, our AGP was an advanced graphics port. It used to be a very common video port, however, it got slower and slower and our video got faster and faster. So we needed a new type of display uh, expansion so that we could have faster and faster video processing. We're going to talk about the newer video here in a second, but I wanted to bring up the next one, which was PCI. And that is for any typical non-video expansion. It uses a common PCI expansion slot Next is our PCI-X, which is just a 64-bit version of it. So when we look at this board, if we look at the top left-hand side, we have two longer white connections. Those are our X or PCI-X or PCI-64-bit uh, slots. The ones next to them, the smaller white ones, those are our pci so, what are the black ones in between? Those would be our PCI Express. Those are our newer video buses. Because they allow for faster connection. Here is the example again. Uh, the white one being a PCI. And then the longer black ones being PCI X16 or P PCI Express X16. So, why do we have to denote them as X16? 
the important part there is notice we have three different types of uh, black expansion slots one small one kind of a little bit bigger and then one fairly large well the smallest one is a 1x it's made to take very specific types of cards then there's a 4x which again is used to take very specific types of cards then lastly which is our PCIe notice there are two PCIe X16s so this one could take two higher end video cards so that probably means we can uh, conclude that it can support two video cards working together for SLI or Crossfire. This, this is a lot of terminology and we're going to go through this a few times just because this is super critical and it takes some time. Now what happens if our case is a case that's uh, non-traditional? We have to have a slot moving down or whatever. We have a PCI riser card and we'll put a connection at a 90 degree angle just in case we might need it. So we already talked about our AGP come in different standards, different speeds. So there were three major releases, one, two, and three. And each release allowed for different speeds. Most AGP is gone away with. It was fairly old, and in today's uh, for today's video, really wouldn't work. Here is a collection of our data pathways and bits. I will let you guys look over it. So the important part here is, let's look at our different types of video. So our PCI Express, notice has multiple versions. There's actually a PCI Express version 3 that's not listed. So as you look at our AGP, that is anywhere between 200, uh, 266 mega, big B, so bytes uh, per second, all the way up to 2.1 gigabytes per second versus our PCI Express well, we'll just use version 2 for now up to 500 megabits megabytes sorry per lane how many lanes is PCI Express up to 32 lanes so let's say that it's only really 16 lanes that's way faster than our AGP. So now let's talk about the ports that are actually built in or built on. Normally those would be our USB, our sound, our network. Could also include our video depending on our motherboard. A keyboard and mouse at our PSD ports just in case. These are going to be important to recognize just because as you look at it you have to kind of uh, be familiar enough to go oh that's USB or that's USB 3 or that's this or that's that just so that you can quickly identify them. If you had to look at uh, look them up every time, you wouldn't be as familiar. And this is going to be something that's fairly common between all computers. So if you don't know them fairly quickly, that probably means you haven't worked on a lot of computers. So it just doesn't breed confidence. Next, IO Shield. That again, that's that metal container at the back that we've already discussed, made to protect everything and your fingers, so that you don't cut anything. So now that we've talked about the major components, how do we configure it? Our motherboard is complicated. So how do we uh, set anything in our motherboard? And all of that's done through our BIOS. Our BIOS actually allows us to turn on or turn off all the, the components, uh, set our features, 
and control what happened with the PC first boots. Uh, normally with older motherboards there was a jumper that controlled the settings. Most motherboards, almost all common motherboards now, we got rid of jumpers. Jumpers were confusing and, if not set correctly, would be uh, would mess up. So most people wonder why there's a battery. The battery there is actually to save our BIOS settings. It provides power to our CMOS RAM, and that's where all the configuration data is hold. Uh, now BIOS and CMOS sadly have been used interchangeably. Our BIOS stands for Input Output System. That's really just every electrical component will have an input output system. It just are the settings for that electrical component. So before we start talking about our BIOS, I want to talk about what's a jumper. A jumper is basically just a connection point between two pins. Here's an example. You'll notice there are three black pins and we have one jumper connecting just two pins. Well, depending on which pins that jumper is connecting to, we can have different types of settings. If it's connecting the first and middle pin, it's going to be, according to the key, our normal. If we actually have it connecting to our middle and our last pin, it'll be our, our configured, and it will do that specific task versus if the jumper is not there, it will be in the recovery state and it will do the third task. So depending on how our jumpers are set up, our motherboard does specific things. So now that we understand jumpers, we can move directly into our BIOS settings. Well, how do we play with our BIOS settings? Or how do we get into our BIOS settings? So this is going to vary from manufacturer. Typically, delete F2 or enter, depending on your motherboard manufacturer. When the PC first turn, turns on, it should flash on the screen fairly quickly. Hit this key to enter setup. And you hit that key to enter our setup, which we'll actually be doing this in class just so that we can get familiar. So here is a generic earlier version of Intel's based uh, BIOS and you'll notice it has all of the things that we can configure in our different tabs uh, whether it be the BIOS version, processor type, how much memory is there, date, time we can move over to configuration or performance and we can adjust everything So our BIOS is slowly being replaced by what's called Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, which is basically just a fancy new version of BIOS that we're now calling it as BIOS. Our BIOS has been around a very long time. It's slow, it's, it's clumsy, and it's old. So we have to find a new way to replace it. If you have Windows 8, you'll start noticing that our boot options are using the UEFI. It's just, again, a cleaner, more controllable uh, way to look at our BIOS. Uh, more modern day computers, instead of having that 2D flat screen, you get some form of 3D interaction and a mouse to help you easily configure our settings. Again, our BIOS configures all onboard devices our processor, its speeds, all of, all of the things that deal directly with our internal workings of our computer essentially. That also includes a power on password or a BIOS password. Uh, that way it actually will not turn on without a password versus a BIOS password so that you can't enter the BIOS without entering a password. That way you don't have students or malicious people uh, 
messing up settings. You also have some form of low jack, uh, which is a specific type of chip that once it's on the, the internet can uh, connect back to a centralized server saying, hey, I'm stolen, here, this is my location. Uh, drive encryption, uh, that is as our technology has been growing, our drive encryption, which is basically just a way of encoding our storage so that uh, they can't be broken into uh, easily. And that is uh, typically allowing for a password or a pass key so that the hard drive's data cannot be uh, read without a password. You see that more in high sensitive areas. Uh, I don't want someone to read my personal like financial records. So I put it on a thumb drive and it's password protected. That way, if I lose it, no one can read it without my pass key or password. Another common one is a TPM. I say common one, but I've never actually seen one, which is a form of encryption key which is kept on the uh, motherboard. It's just another faster way to do drive encryption. Uh, next would be virtualization. Uh, virtualization is just a physical machine acting as multiple machines. Uh, newer processors have specialized instructions to turn on virtualization and all that is it just kind of optimizes code so that it can run a virtualization. Uh, any, almost any PC can run a virtual machine. It's just is it optimized for it? Uh, lastly, uh, would be our saving. Do we want to? If we made any changes, do we want to save them? If we don't want to save them, we could dis uh, discard discard them. Uh, if we're not sure what we're dealing with, uh, we could actually load default settings. Or if we accidentally made a change and we want to go back and revert those changes, we could just discard all of the changes and go back. Notice, instead of exiting discard versus discard, our exit discard would just exit out of this menu and discard them, versus our discard, which would just set all of them back. So a motherboard is considered a field replaceable unit and a few things that we have to think about when we deal with our motherboards is how to update our drivers, what's a driver, uh, we haven't talked about drivers yet. So a driver is basically just the software used to communicate with the hardware. Next, how to update our BIOS. A BIOS is just like anything else. There's newer versions coming out quite regularly, and how we update them is we go to the manufacturer's website of that particular motherboard, and we find the BIOS. There's going to be different ways to do this depending on your motherboard, so you just follow the instructions as they state. This is a super critical thing here, is we have to be careful. When we update our BIOS, we do have the, likely, or the chance, not likelihood, but we do have a slim chance of destroying our motherboard. Because if you're updating the BIOS and the PC got restarted, well, it could cause the motherboard to just completely not function because it has part of the old BIOS, part of the new BIOS. So we all want to take some diligence when we deal with our BIOS. However, most newer motherboards have some form, uh, form of BIOS recovery. So our BIOS is very subjective when we talk about updating. It all depends on the situation. Uh, lastly is replacing that little battery. Because again, our BIOS settings are stored in our CMOS memory. If we replace the battery, we leave all, all of those settings. So before replacing the battery, we might want we might want to check what settings are in place before we replace the battery 
Just that way we can make sure that all of the settings are put back correctly. So updating our motherboard drivers, again we, manu uh, we go to the manufacturer's website and we find the updated drivers. BIOS, same thing. We go to the manufacturer's website and we get the instructions from them to upgrade. So what would be some of the reasons to upgrade? Uh, sometimes just uh, BIOS versions are unstable uh, or it has new features that weren't originally planned but came out. Or they could unlock or they could improve performance. There's numerous reasons to upgrade our BIOS, just again, your situation. Here are some of the examples of why you might, or my, uh, how you get up your, your BIOS. Then we'll talk about the why. So there's uh, Express updates, there's USB updates, there's bootable disk. There are several ways to update our BIOS, but why? why? Why do we want to do it? So the common line of thinking is, if it's not broke, don't fix it. One of the issues here is, one of the big issues here is, well, how do you know if it's broke? You don't know. What about additional features or additional performance that you might get by updating? You start weighing it. Your experience versus if you've never done it before. I like to use, I normally give it a month or two before I update to the newest BIOS just to make sure that it's stable before I update. That way you can make sure. But it's going to vary depending on you, the individual and the actual uh, situation. So there is no like general rule of thumb of the best way to do this, just because it's going to be very... Well, it's going to vary. So again, replacing the CMOS battery, uh, just like anything when we work inside the case, we just pop it off, put a new one in. But before we remove it, we want to document our settings. Uh, installing or replacing a motherboard is pretty straightforward. Uh, I will let you read the 20 step process, which is we look at uh, make sure we have the right motherboard, be familiar with the documentation. I will let you read through all 20 steps. I don't think that that's necessary for me to do. One of the last things that I wanted to talk about was maintenance. I know I skipped over that slide because I want to talk about it last. So a motherboard, just like any other component, requires maintenance. You have to clean it. Uh, it has uh, dust buildup and dirt buildup, just like anything else. So we have to properly maintain and clean our motherboard. Typically we do this through just compressed air and blowing out the dirt and dust. Well. I want to thank you and I hope you have a great day. If you have questions, please feel free to stop by, drop me a line, email me, let me know. Thank you and have a great day.